Boom, I'm in the room. Welcome everybody to Ordinary People's Extraordinary Stories. Now, I've got a wonderful guest on today. So, without too much further ado, I'll introduce him. Uh, we'll get him in and then we'll see what his life's been about. So, uh, Massimo. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you so much for having me today, Tim. I'm looking forward to our talk. Oh, you're most, most welcome. So, Massimo, can you uh, tell me when and where you were born? And if you can describe to me what it was like, where you grew up, the schools you went to, and the education that you received. So the floor is yours. Fantastic. Well, I was born the last day of August in 1975 in Lincoln, Nebraska. And there's one thing that is very true about being a Nebraskan and probably especially true of living in Lincoln, Nebraska, is that you're a Husker fan through and through. And no matter where you live in this country, that's one thing that has never left me. Uh, there is a great enthusiasm in this state about being a Nebraskan, and I don't think I have ever lost that. Uh, in everywhere I've been in this world. And that's a fantastic kind of feeling of camaraderie that you get just uh, living in Lincoln. So I began uh, going to public school when uh, I was five years old. And I coincidentally went to the same elementary school that my grandfather had gone to uh, 50 years before me. So that was kind of an interesting uh, situation, but cool in a way. I was a good student and uh, excelled quite well. And I'm gonna take a, just a very short backtrack because it's important in my overall story, is that I was, uh, my, my mom and my father um, split before I was born and I did not uh, know my father until I was 21 years old. My mom remarried when uh, I was three years old and I was subsequently adopted by the man I call my dad. And he raised me and that had a significant impact on basically anything else that we're gonna talk about today. Uh, that, that really shaped my life in a very profound way. So that was kind of the initial uh, primary years, my dad took me everywhere with him. He was uh, in advertising uh, and I had the unique opportunity to experience business in a way that I think most kids never would. He would take me to meetings. He would take me to pick up things for work. He would take me to printing companies to proof things. And I learned so much about business at a very young age because of this and how to interact and transact business in a proper way at a very young age. And in addition to that, he was a bit of an entrepreneur himself. I think maybe something he wanted to delve into maybe deeper in life, but did not. And I got to experience some of those business uh, startups in uh, growing up. And that was an exciting thing that, that also shaped kind of who I am today. Well, that's quite a start in life. So let's just take you back a little bit then. So um, your old man left before you were born. Um, your mum remarried, got a guy to bring you up. So in the early days, what was what was the, the the house and what was the street like where you actually grew up in Nebraska? Oh, yeah, yeah. So I grew up in a a very small house uh, that was about eight hundred square feet. It, uh, it it was on a street with a bunch of other small homes built in you know during the war, so during the forties, and so no eaves, no special add-ons. You know, there wasn't enough wood to go around during the that time period, so. <laughs> You, did, you didn't have any of the uh, extras that you did. You didn't have any porches. You didn't have anything like that in these homes. They're just very boxy and just enough to, to put a roof over someone's head. But it was a very... Um, uh, kids were out playing. It, it was a very 
fun neighborhood, uh, riding my bike around the neighborhood. Some of my uh, best memories during that time period in my life. Uh, I, I helped uh, the elderly in the neighborhood as well. I did some gardening and uh, some snow shoveling and all those fun things when I was younger. And that was that felt good as well, you know, so I, I, I really enjoyed my neighborhood. It was, uh, it felt very traditional in a way that I don't think that you often see today because it, it everybody was always out after work. Everybody was, you know, it, it just yeah. was very friendly and open. Hmm. So your first school then, can you remember much about sort of your kindergarten? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mrs. Lancaster was my teacher. Um, yeah, I, I definitely. She retired that year. It was her last year teaching. Um, and I've often wondered, but I, I don't know if I can verify this in any way. She had taught at that school for 50 years, which means it's entirely possible that my grandpa had her as a teacher. But I never uh, have delved in to find that out. Uh, <laughs> that would be a fascinating, so, fascinating to find yeah. out. Where the those 50 years of first first year of teaching she would have taught your grandfather yes, and the last yes. and the last year of teaching she taught her grandson that that would that that's the, the there's a mission for you to go and find yeah, out yeah. whether she I actually think I might do that <laughs> and that that would be a fascinating fact that you could you could pass on that to you were taught by the same teacher as your grandfather. <laughs> yes, that would be. You know, history like that, that those types of hidden histories are really fun to explore. From You know, there's so much history that's uh, in everything around us, and everybody always focus on nation history when there's some yeah. kind of unique facts around us that make life really interesting. Yeah, I think that's 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 what this show's really about is to to, to get ordinary people's extraordinary stories of how how they um, got to where they've got to. Yeah. So, Mrs. Lancaster, your first year was her last. So, uh, what was she like? She was very kind. Uh, I remember that she had reddish hair and um, and she always had it up in like a bun. It's, it's interesting the things that you can remember from that long ago. So, but I, I remember that she was always very encouraging uh, towards me. I was, a, I was a bit of a precocious young person. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, so I would, I would have conversations with my teacher in ways that a lot of my classmates would, would not. And this caused some some challenges. I had some real social challenges when I was that age because I couldn't quite relate uh, to kids my age. And and so I found myself, you know, on a playground situation, I'd go hang out with the fourth graders and <laughs> and Mrs. <laughs> Lancaster always trying to pull me back like the class is over here, you know, but it was <laughs> you go where you feel that you're engaged in life, right? <laughs> now, now, what would be really funny if she had just said to you, now I remember your grandfather. <laughs> Doing exactly the same. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> now that would have been funny. That would have been funny. Oh man. Uh. Yeah. So move, <laughs> moving on then. So you didn't really assimilate with with your your classmates, but your older class or the older kids in the school. Now was the yeah. school, um, your kindergarten the same as your your elementary and your your middle school and your upper school, your your high school? Was it all in the one building? Or, or was it totally separate buildings, separate schools? It, it was totally separate. And to take the journey to high school, we have to move around the country a bit and change schools and, and so on and so forth. So I remained uh, there at Randolph Elementary in Lincoln until uh, the, I guess, about midway through fifth grade. Hmm. Um, so that would have been 1985. And... So I remember all of my teachers through through that time period. I was especially close with my second grade teacher, Mrs. Silberstein, for whatever reason. I would go and visit her long after I had left second grade. And sometimes, you know, generally a couple times a month, I would stop by after school and, and converse with her. She was always just very encouraging to my academic growth. And I latched onto that. Hmm. So... 
did you go to school on your bike or did you have to get on the big yellow bus or did you just have to walk down a road? Well, you know, this is kind of cool. So as I was writing my memoir, uh, so I, I actually went and I walked the old route from home to class just to bring back memories. Uh, so, yeah, I walked to school every morning. It was uh, six and a half blocks. So it wasn't that bad. Um, I think that walking like that, it brought back so many memories. I remember different people that'd be out in the morning uh, that I would say hi to as I walked by. I couldn't remember their names, but just walking that path again brought back so many memories. It was really kind of cool to do. And how, how often did you have to, to dodge the paper boy that was throwing papers onto people's porches? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember much of that, actually, but I, I do remember uh, sometimes traffic being so bad, but I had to cross a, a street with a light on it, and, and sometimes people not stopping and, and being worried about, uh, you know, getting hit. <laughs> you know, that's about the, yeah, getting hit by a car, not a paper. <laughs> <laughs> so it's quite a busy busy walk to school then with lots of traffic about yes. that time of the day yeah yeah and and that's something that you know, i think today especially here in the united states i don't know about the uk but it's something that is almost avoided and i i think that's to the detriment of of character growth because you you walk to school with people that were of all ages and you had the social interaction. You had to learn how to get along with people. And today, if you're just dropped off at the front door, you're very isolated. And I, hmm. and I think that isolation really is a detraction from uh, everyone's growth in life. Yeah, I mean, when I went to school as a kid, uh, school was about three miles away, and we had to walk each way. And uh, wow. walk into school in the wintertime in shorts wasn't a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that, that, that was, had to be that cold was such a long time ago that's in the 60s so yeah life was a little bit different back then <laughs> so so a bit more about your uh your elementary school then what was your mm -hmm. most favorite lesson what was the one that you just had to get up for in the morning you you, you didn't sleep but because you wanted to get up and get to school to do at that time period it was definitely math yeah, wow. math was where it was at for me. Uh, as as I would go on in life, history became that that overtaking subject. But math and science was always important. But the intriguing things in life, I think, are the stories, and so history is always just captivates me. Hmm. So, what was the subject you you just you you tried to pull a sickie on? What was what was the the subject that you just didn't want to get out of bed for and, and you're, you're trying to wriggle out of it. What, what was that? You know, it. as an author, this is going to sound hilarious, but English. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think quite I often hate, people I find... Hate, I hated it. I hated English. I hated to write. I did not like... No, I mean, anything to get out of, of uh, English. Just did not like it. <laughs> But quite often people find that one of the subjects that they, they don't like at school, then they really get captured later in life. Yeah. So I guess that's yeah. happened with you with, with, with your English. Yes, yes, it has. And the reason I didn't like English is that, and, and I think we both know this as English speakers, English is, does not have, it has more rules and exceptions than it does anything else and that makes it challenging in a way that is not very solvable and my brain tends to be more on the mathematical of let's complete uh, you know two plus two equals four but <laughs> when you start di when you start diagramming a, a sentence in english i mean it could go any which direction right so it's yeah. i think that's what it was really frustrating for me is it didn't click in my head at that time uh that the nuances of the english mm. language so moving on then, um, what about your middle school? Yeah, so middle school became kind of a very unique path. So we moved from Lincoln to south of Lincoln uh, onto an acreage. And I went to Norris, uh, was the name of the school, for fifth and sixth grade. And I'm going to take you on the, the journey through middle school and then we'll we can delve into anything you want to. So then uh, my dad got a transfer to Maslin, Ohio, 
and I landed at uh, uh, Pfeiffer Middle School and Edison Junior High. And then we left there and returned to Lincoln when I was in eighth grade and I went to uh, Leffler uh, Middle School here in Lincoln at that time. And so middle school was chaos for me because it, it was, I mean, it was just, it was a blur. It was moving. It was making new friends or trying to, it, 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 it was a very challenging period. Mm. And I guess if you, if you're going across different, um, sort of curriculums, that doesn't help. Uh, and, and I guess one, one school's, um, more advanced than the other schools, so you, you don't really even catch up, or, 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 or you're you're way ahead, and and you sort of um, twist, uh, twiddling your thumbs, waiting for them to catch up with you. So, uh, I, yes. I, I'm, I assume that you've run through all those dramas before you mm-hmm. you finally got back to um, Lincoln. So, mm-hmm. what was it like coming back to to Lincoln and then going to to that new school? Were there any of your old mates there from your, your your earlier days? Yeah, actually about a third of the uh, students that I had gone to elementary school, I found I was back with in, in middle school. And of course, that's not the same. You change a lot in those years in your life. So, and the, the people that, if you stay with a, a group of friends, and you go all through your schooling with those mates, you know, you, you can, you, you basically, you remain friends for the most part. And so if you walk away, you grow differently. And as you do, you return, you're like, I'm not friends with these people anymore. They don't match (laughs) where I'm at. Right. And so they didn't accept me back into their, nor did I really seem inter. I really wasn't interested. I I didn't, Mm -hmm. they just didn't fit who I had become. And so I had to, basically make new friends it was it was starting over and that and that's a challenge especially at that age i think mm. it's um, you're you're growing up yourself at that point in life and it, it's very tough was it a, was it a really big school or, or was it still sort of fairly rural uh no this is big school because it was in lincoln so the the class size was around 200 or so if I recall correctly, hmm. so that's a that's a that's a far cry from the when I went to elementary school. You, I had maybe forty, so that's a big big change. Hmm. And I, I don't know quite how the the education system works over there, um, but with, with so such a big class uh, in, in the year, are, are you streamed? Do, do you have sort of the A stream and the, and the B and the C stream and then you, you've got the, the bits in the middle and, and then the, the D stream that <laughs> nobody's interested in? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, there there's definitely becomes a, a separation and this is one of the challenges that I, I've talked about, I write about in my, my first book is that as you move around this country, the education system is so disjointed that one level of advanced placement or, you know, really strong student in one school is maybe not strong in another school, or at least based on what they view as strong. And so it, it provides a really ch- big challenge. When we moved back to Lincoln, they judged the school in Ohio as being um, inept by comparison. And they threw mm-hmm. me into general studies classes, which was very frustrating to me um, and I, I really had to fight hard between my, um, eighth and beginning of my ninth grade year to get placed into advanced classes because I was literally twiddling my thumbs, making paper airplanes, not taking any homework. Co- I, I mean, I had just got to a point I didn't want to go to school at all because it wasn't challenging. Mm. So did you achieve that? Did, did you I manage did. to get pushed up into the right classes? Um, and, and I started getting challenged in the ninth, ninth grade. I did, but then it repeated itself because uh, as I go into high school, we moved to Overland Park, Kansas, where I, uh, I went to Shawnee Mission West High School. And when I landed there, they said that the Lincoln schools were not up to their 
scratch. And so they <laughs> threw me back into general studies at the end of my ninth grade year. And I had to do the same exact challenge every counselor and talk with administrators and bring in parents. And it, it was a it was a large challenge to then return again. But I had to suffer through half a year of, again, not not learning anything. And, and that's not any fun. <laughs> I mean, no, not just, at all. It's, it's not. But but do you think having suffered that uh, sort of injustice, really, did, yeah. did that kind of make you a tougher person? Did that make you more determined to get on? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because it, it taught me the, I think very early on, the need and the, uh, the power of negotiation. It, it might surprise you, but I found myself negotiating with administrators that place me in this, if I do not perform, return me in a semester to the previous studies. Um, it, it's interesting that you can bargain <laughs> like that as a, <laughs> I mean, it is kind of interesting that you can, but I was put in a situation where based on where the school I had come from, they did not want to make any changes. And so those negotiations that happened in ninth grade um, in high school it were directly with the principal of the school saying, look, if I can't perform by the middle of 10th grade, then put me back in the general studies classes. I mean, mm. I performed, so I was okay, but they weren't going to do it. He had to sign off on it. Wow. <clears throat> so he went right to the top then, right to the big cheese, uh, the Grand Fromage. Well, why? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> why, why mess around with the middleman? You know you need his signature. That's it. You may as well go to the top. <laughs> <laughs> so he signed off on it, and uh, and you, 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 you finally sort of dragged your way through high school. And... Uh, did you graduate with honors in the end then? I did. I graduated with honors. Uh, I was I was near the top of my class. I don't remember the percentage, but I was high enough that I graduated with honors. Um, and yeah, it, it, it was good. High school was good. I, uh, I did a lot of activities. I was in band, uh, choir, orchestra, um, I was several plays, cross country, track. I, I was a pretty engaged extracurricular activity guy too ah so music then what uh, what instrument did you play bassoon was my symphonic instrument and uh i marched the clarinet and i also play the piano so ah. so music is music very important to me oh yeah 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 i love i music is such a large piece of my life not as large now as it, it was previously in life but it, it it definitely is something that that grounds me and and is an escape for me mm. so um you mentioned um you were in a couple of plays what were the plays oh boy well let's see here uh, I remember uh, The King and I I'm sure that uh, just about anybody can remember that um yeah. We did, we did a, uh, a theater in the round uh, called Noises Off. That was uh, very interesting. I don't know if uh, the audience is familiar with theater in the round, but basically you have to act in the center with audience on four sides. And it, it, it uh, makes it very difficult when you're, you know, you can't break the fourth wall. <laughs> you have to <laughs> pretend like you got to pretend like you're looking directly into the audience, but it's a wall. It, it's a it's a very challenging way to act. But that was uh, that was my senior year. And that was a, a definitely mm. a, an interesting uh, uh, work. Meet me in St. Louis. That was uh, I, I definitely in, enjoyed that performance as well. So did you get a lead role? Did you play the king in The King and I? No, I didn't play a lead. I, you know, one of my best friends was uh, the guy who always got the lead roles and, uh, and good for him. Um, so I was uh, in a supporting role. Uh, but, you know, I don't even remember the character that I played, to be frank with you, in, in, in any of these. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I did. I, I enjoyed my time on stage. It, it was uh, it was fantastic. Hmm. So. Graduated with honors. What about yeah prom? Did you did you go uh, to prom and did you take a young lady with you? 
I did. I did. I, I went to prom. I took my high school sweetheart. Her name was Shara. She was a delightful, intelligent, beautiful woman. Um, and um, yeah, it, it was a fantastic prom. Had fun with uh, with everybody that was there. And it was it was a great time. You know, it's it, it was a good memory and not all proms are, but it, it definitely was a good memory. Outstanding. So what did you do? After you graduated, what was your well? What was your, what was the first thing you did? Well, after I graduated, well, I worked uh, full time right after I graduated. As I was in high school, I I got a summer job at a pharmacy, McDaniel's Pharmacy in Kansas City, and I had worked my way up. That by the time I graduated. I was instantly promoted to an assistant manager position of one of their stores. And that took me through that summer before I, I went to, to college. Um, but that, that was a uh, working at McDaniels was a, a very big step for me. Again, it gave me a lot of uh, business knowledge that I've used throughout my life. I jokingly say sometimes that nearly everything that I learned at McDaniels, I apply in my daily business life today because I was, I, I got there young. I learned so much from the owner of the company and he took me under his wing in a lot of ways and would often direct me along with his brother, who was the VP of the company. And they both were very good at, uh, at showing me, you know, what needed to be done in, in business and how the business operated. It was really cool. Mm. So at the end of that summer, then you went off to uh, to college. Where did, did you go to college and what course did you take? I went to Kansas State University and I was a chemical engineering pre-medicine major. Oh, so, I mean, that's, a, that's quite a, a challenging <laughs> subject to get into, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Did, did you survive uh, like the baptism of fire? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. No, if it isn't challenging, I don't really want to do it. I, I think my, I think that's kind of like the true story of my life all the way through. <laughs> uh, but there was something, uh, that, you know, from a psychological standpoint that really started to happen here. So late in kind of my senior year in high school, I started being really um challenged by feelings of mania and uh i i had a very difficult time controlling sleep sometimes i would go two days or or more without sleeping and i went to the psychiatrist at uh, k-state and i was diagnosed at the time of as being mixed bipolar and of course i disregarded this diagnosis out of hand no there's nothing wrong with me and uh, that's obviously not the case. However, <laughs> when, when you're 18 years old, you know everything. So of course um, you do. Who, who could possibly know more than I at that age? And, and we all feel that way at that age. That's what's so incredible is I think it's just that turning of, of, of a tide in your in your existence that you just feel like, you know, more than everyone else. And then eventually you get old enough that you realize you don't know anything and you're always happy to listen to what anyone else has to tell you right <laughs> it completely flips eventually in life so anyone who's young listening to this yeah keep that in mind uh yeah <laughs> but good what sound I did advice that, <laughs> thank you um so what i did at this point though is that i started to self-medicate and in doing that i i started drinking and any time that I felt my mind racing out of control, I would drink. And I refused to take any medicine related to being bipolar. And I thought in America you can't you can't drink until you're 21. That so is how correct. Where did you manage to lay your hands on booze at, at sort of 18, 19 then? Well, I had lots of friends that were 21. I was at college. It was pretty easy <laughs> at the time. I, uh, I, I didn't, I didn't struggle getting my hands on any liquor. That's, I think that that's kind of par for the course when you're in college. Um, <laughs> if I, if, 
if I had not been in college, it may have been a little bit more challenging, but because I was at, at school, it was pretty easy. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and, and so at the time that this was going on, you know, I had this, this liquor habit that I suddenly had to, uh, kind of take care of a little bit. And I was going to school on my own. Uh, my parents were not assisting in, in any way. So I was paying my way through school. And I had been making really good money at McDaniel's, so I struck up a bargain where I would return back to Kansas City and work weekends and be the weekend manager at uh, the store, which was perfect. So I would I would tool out of class on Friday. I'd, I'd return to Kansas City. I'd work 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. on Saturday and Sunday and then return to K-State after uh, work on Sunday night and then go to class at 7 a.m. on Monday morning. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so how did you manage that, to cope with that then? <laughs> whew, man, I, I, I was able to do it. I don't know how exactly, but I did it for the entire second semester that I was uh, there at K-State. And then I, I started to think maybe this isn't going to work. Maybe I should go to college closer to home. So I transferred to the University of Kansas, which is only 30 minutes away and for the following year. And then that's where I went for my uh, sophomore year of college. Hmm. And so how long was your, your course? And, and, and did you carry on the same course of um, the... Um, <laughs> chemical engineering? Yes. Chemical no, engineering. I, I did. Yeah. So I continued my chemical engineering and, and pre-med studies, uh, but I would not uh, finish. This would be my final year of college. During, uh, during this year, I, I started to really uh, struggle more with, with the bipolar uh, aspect. I start, and, and then the interest in working became so it, it took such a grip on me i had so much uh leeway and control i mean i i was a manager of a pharmacy and making you know the equivalent of about fifty thousand dollars in today's dollars a year and i was 19 years old you know what <laughs> i'm <laughs> I, i'm what why on earth would i go to college and become a doctor you know that was that was my my kind of path in life and mm. and so i just dropped okay. out yeah so dropping out did the uh did the pharmacy keep you on full time they did they did and uh and then i left that pharmacy and another pharmacy hired me on uh in, in a larger uh group and and i was that was a year later um so i was 20 years old and I was working at a drug emporium. I had 60 employees and was managing about a $12 million a year store at, at the time. I mean, I guess that'd be about a $36 million store today, but, um, and I, and I wasn't even able to drink. I always laugh about that. So I, <laughs> I hear it. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, most of my employees were twice my age and yet I, I commanded a, a pretty good, I had to learn a lot. I had to learn how to really interact with people that were older than me and to, and to drive. Um, uh, it, it taught me a lot about leadership really more than anything, mm. because I, I didn't have a choice. I had been put in this position because I had performed and therefore I had to lead people when I had no idea how to do that at all. None. I had a really good assistant manager that I leaned on who was in his um, late fifties and he really gave me some good guidance and, and approaching. And I said, well, why did you, t you know, take this position? I had been hired away from another company to come and, and fill this position. And he said, he just didn't want it. Uh, that that uh, he said, something that you will learn as you get older is that there are people that want to be leaders and there are people who would rather just support leaders. I was like, huh. He goes, you're a leader, so you will never understand what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> He's right. I, I mean, I, I, but he, he showed, he opened my eyes to the different types of people that, that are in support roles and that why it's so important to, to help build those people up and support and, and make yourself, um, 
by bringing everyone together, you can really make yourself into a great team. And if it weren't for his guidance, I would have lost out on a lot of that, which helped me as I move forward in, in mm. my next steps in starting my own companies. So how long was you at uh, that company for? How long did that last? I was all... I was only there for six months. At the time, outside of there, I had uh, acquired a uh, business uh, mentor by the name of Jeff. And Jeff was this guy who, I don't know, he just always made me feel like anything was possible. He was in sales and he, he took me shoot, uh, suit shopping and, and he got me looking good. He, he made me start reading the Wall Street Journal every day. He, he, he was somebody who like, really took me under his wing and and showed me that you could learn what you needed to learn from what was publicly available and you didn't necessarily have to go to school to figure these things out and uh i've always had a, a way to recognize patterns and he he told me to start reading uh more in different areas if i had a, a particular industry that 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 was interesting to me he said, read everything you can about that industry. But then as you read other things that are going on in in uh, the news, you'll be able to apply that and go, hey, if they did this and this, that would be more successful. He said, then you can apply that in your business life and you'll start to see trends be much more valuable to your bosses as you as you grow. And boy, that was some sound advice that I have taken with me for the rest of my life because it, it really it really does work. Everything is interrelated. I mean, and, and mm -hmm. if, if you see, a, I mean, a case in point, so many people are completely oblivious to the fact that the price of plastic is completely 100% impacted on the price of crude oil. And, and so anytime you, you see challenges in different industries, it's like, oh, well, there must be this underlying cause. You see that oil's going up. Well, plastics is going to go up the following quarter because they're not going to be able yeah. to hold the, the price point. And so you can start to look at those things. And if it weren't for Jeff, I never would have learned how to do that. Hmm. So six months into this job then, and you've got uh, an opportunity. So what did you do? Did you set your own business up? I, I did not, but I ventured to Springfield, Missouri, and I went to a, work with Jeff at this new company that was starting up. It was called Unicard, and it was a precursor to what eventually became the Visa uh, check card, and I worked on that project. Uh, it was very exciting time to, this would have been like 1990, early 96, and Unicard was utilizing the systems to process checks with a card but visa wasn't yet doing a, a check card and the debit cards were like oh. very very minimal throughout the the and so i went to my boss and i said well why don't we just get the visa logo and and then our card will be accepted more places and so that's kind of where the avenue went down and the rest is, as they say, history, because by the end of that year, Visa recognized the good idea that it was and Unicard ceased to exist. And we now have the Visa check card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I don't have I don't have any money to show for it. But uh, I mean, it was uh, it was a crazy idea at the time. But it, that one really led me to say, OK, I can trust my unique thoughts to go out on my own. And that's what I did next. Mm. So what did you set up then? What business did start, you set up? I started a web business that was focused on payment processing uh, and, and bringing, for, well, I just come out of payment processing. So I had some kind of base knowledge here. So I thought, well, hmm. how can I apply it? So my idea was to start getting companies to do transactions online. And AMC Theaters is, is based in the Kansas City area. It's one of my first thoughts was, well, I'm going to sell movie tickets online. That'll be, that'll be a big, that'll be, you know, I got yeah, laughed bro. out of that meeting. I got <laughs> laughed out of that meeting. I'm not kidding. They thought that, that was, why would any, why would anyone buy a movie ticket online? I'm like, oh, it's, it's so, it's so interesting to look back and, and be ahead of the curve like that. <laughs> um, so, but no, I, I did no, help. No, I, you can't get a, 
Now you now you have to buy a ticket online because you yeah, can't get yeah. one at the <laughs> the picture house. <laughs> yeah. Now you show up and they say we well, have to buy it on the app on your phone before you can walk in here. I'm like, can I buy a ticket here? No. Can I use cash? No. I mean, no. so it's. It, it, I mean, it's completely flipped on its head. Again, though, this was more like it. It, it confirmed once again that. I was moving in the right direction and that eventually that there were things that would find success for me. Mm. Um, and I did help several companies actually start processing and doing transactions online. But my big idea out of that time period that someone else ended up doing was movie tickets. And, and funny enough, it actually was somebody that was in that meeting room that day. So <laughs> <laughs> did, did you hit him for copyright? <laughs> Nah, you know, you just have to move on. I think that that's the other thing um, is it, another good idea is going to come along and you can you can go after and tackle somebody like that. But you should just out innovate them instead. Just just think of the next yeah. great thing. Yeah, yeah, you know, I think I think it's it's there's no fun looking in the rearview mirror in life, you know. No. <laughs> yeah. The only thing you can do with history is learn from it. That's correct. Very and you, true. And, and, and yeah. <laughs> and you, you can make history, but you can't change it. <laughs> yeah. Very true. Very true. So from there, I, uh, I went to work um, at uh, Sprint uh, at the time, which is now part of T-Mobile. And I was working on, uh, I, this is amazing. So I had no engineering background, right? But I interviewed for an engineering job and got it. Uh, and started working in their uh, their planning department, placing a new switch into their network. And this was my first time working at a large corporation, and that provided a lot of new things that you have to learn. That uh, there's a lot of social interactions that I was not adept at grasping yet. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I. I, I really was of the belief that, hey, if I've got a good idea, I can just, you know, do it. I don't have to go through seven layers of management to make it happen. And, yeah, I got called yeah. out more times than I can count. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. But I had a really good boss that gave me a lot of cover and often be like, if you're going to do something, just tell me you're going to do it and then just yeah. do it. And and, and uh he began to trust me and to trust my judgment that I wasn't going to do anything stupid. I just wasn't going to get all the requisite forms stamped before I did it. <laughs> <laughs> Short circuit and, the system. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, the difference is, is that whatever I implemented got done and whatever went through the system would not be done a year later. So that's, that's oftentimes why he, he would even bring me things and say, Hey, we need to get this done. And I'd be like, you want me to do it? <laughs> and that would be how, yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, exactly. So, so bring uh, us along there, a bit further then. Yeah, yeah. From there, I mean, in rapid fire, I uh, I started uh, doing a lot of on the, on the side, developing websites and doing some programming and the like. And then I stumbled upon a company that was going out of business that uh, my company was providing IT for. They were in association management, and I took on uh, three of their largest clients, and this would have been right in 2000, 2001 timeframe, and went out on my own again, uh, leaving Sprint. And I really didn't like this job. I didn't like this company I'd formed, but it was doing really well. Uh, and at the time, I, I started uh, seeing this model and uh, one, one day she asked me to look at one of her contracts and I looked it over and made some changes and, and then it was another contract. And before I knew it, here I am uh, in the midst of more or less representing somebody. And it was a heck of a lot more fun than whatever the heck I was doing at the time. So I, <laughs> I picked up stakes and I, uh, I, I went full bore into working in the entertainment uh, business, representing man, uh, you know, representing and managing talent in uh, Los Angeles for the next you know, six, seven years of my life. 
and oh. uh, that was an that was an adventure. <laughs> so, did you have anybody uh, uh, famous on the books? No, I didn't. Well, nobody that was like super famous on the books. Uh, you know, I I because I worked a lot on Deal or No Deal. I happened to uh, know a princess that you uh, happen to have, but. <laughs> But other than other than other than knowing her in passing, I don't I don't have uh, anyone that was super famous. But I, I represented a lot of, of talent that was like on the cusp of, of being great. And, and oftentimes, mm. uh, you know, they would there are a lot of people, that I think, that they get into the business uh, for different reasons. And especially a lot of the females that uh, that that enter into uh, and come to Los Angeles. I think they're looking for a spouse in a lot of ways, quite frankly, looking yeah, back at it Somebody with now. a lot of money. <laughs> yep, exactly. And it's very easy for that to happen. I mean, the, you're, you're dealing with a place where some of the most beautiful people on earth come to try to make it. Um, mm. And there are a lot of very successful men that recognize the fact that the per capita of beautiful women is much higher there. And so they come to Los Angeles to find themselves a spouse. And, and, and that's great. And so it works out. Everybody's happy. But I think there's a lot of truth to that. That's what I saw over my, my time in, in working there. Mm. So bring us a bit more up to date then. Sure. So then uh, as all of this is going on, I don't want to miss out on this, is that I'm getting deeper and deeper into a daily drinker. This escalated quite uh, uh, fast as I, as I made my way in working in entertainment. Uh, and, and then I uh, brought along the cocaine sidecar at this point but, but mm -hmm. when I was in Los Angeles. So now I'm, uh, I'm doing both drugs and one to, to keep me going and the other because, uh, you know, struggling with mania from time to time. Um, but I was functioning. Uh, I would classify myself as a high functioning alcoholic drug addict, I guess. Um, I, <laughs> I met, I met someone, uh, and she was a client of mine. We got married, um, and uh, moved back to the Kansas city area, back to Overland park, Kansas. And I started a printing company of all things. And that's was uh, this was fun. This was this was a lot of fun, actually. I was uh, involved in variable data printing, printing insurance contracts. Uh, so you would get files every day that would dump in and, and then you would spit out thousands of different contracts and all the programming and and everything that was involved in that made it very um, it, it was very challenging. So it was a lot of mm -hmm. a lot of fun. But that was not helping uh, me at the same time. I just was getting more drunk and, uh, and, and using more cocaine. And I ended up uh, divorcing my wife in 2012. My business started, the wheels started coming off. Um, and I found myself ultimately homeless at the end of 2014 after losing everything. So I've gone mm. from the... the Literally, quite literally, the mountaintop to uh, living on the street. Yeah. So how was that? So, I mean, did, I mean that 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 is a hell of a, a drop. And um, <laughs> did did that did that give you a bit of a, a, a slap around the face and a, and, and a wake up call and uh, sort of wake up and smell the coffee? Look what you've done to yourself. You would think so, but it would take me uh, fifteen months to wrangle myself back to sobriety so i was on the street december 7th of 2014 and i did not uh, find myself sober until uh, march 23rd of 2016 and that's i've been sober ever since that um it, it was a it was a tough a tough go while i was there so mm. uh i i met a, a girl after i'd been divorced on a beach in destin florida samantha thomas and she and I had become really fast friends. This was in uh, early 2014 before I had ended up on the street. And while I was on the street, she and I kept in contact uh, quite regularly, uh, even exchanging letters. And she was the, she was the single largest exterior uh, assistance in getting me sober to like show me that I needed to get back on track. Mm. And that's... Uh, yeah, she she was really the genesis of that effort. Hmm. 
she was a catalyst that brought you back to some sort of normality yeah. then. Yeah, absolutely. So how, how did you, you finally sort of stop drinking, stop taking drugs? You, you, I guess you went for all the cold turkey and all the rest of that, that horrendous stuff that you have to go through before you actually um, are in a, a state where you can you can function properly again. Yeah, well, I actually had a, a near-death experience where I was out for being in the process of being revived for over six minutes in August of 2015. And you would think that after 15 days in the hospital after that occurred, I was I was drunk three weeks later. I, I still could not get through whatever was ailing me. And, mm. and the interesting, then I went into rehab in, in October of that year. And that's when I finally figured out that the root of my pain was abandonment. So now we go back to the genesis of my story in life of being yeah. abandoned by my father. And that was eating at me in such a way that I never felt good enough for anyone else around me. And that will, that drags you down. That brings you down a, a lot in life. Um, I was always out to prove something, prove something, mm. not necessarily to myself, but to others. And, and being so driven in that way and not really focusing on anything internally to me. So everything I was doing, it was all out to prove that I was worth something to other people. And I didn't understand that before. I just was successful. So yeah. from any outward look, I had it together, but I didn't have it together at all. I was a mess. <laughs> I was so an that, absolute mess. So, so that, that, that bit from your father leaving before you were born had a detrimental effect on your whole of your life, yeah. pretty much. Yep. That's sure outrageous. Did. Mm. Uh, we all handle things differently, you know? What happens Absolutely. to one person does, doesn't mean it will yeah. happen to another. I have a, I have a dear friend who um, is similar type of situation with a, a son that he's adopted, so he would be, this friend of mine would be equivalent of like my dad, and I told him, you know, how important it is to tell his son that, you know, he's worth something and that he, that you'll be there for him. And it's like, it, it, I mean, I'm not saying that his son will have the same challenges I did, but it just, it, it brings up the thing that, it, you know, it's important it, it to look at. It just takes it off at the pass. It just yeah. preempts any, any dramas that could unfold in the future. Yeah. So from your perspective then, how how did you get back after after that? I mean, you got drunk three weeks after being turfed out of hospital, uh, and you've gone into rehab. How have you managed since? So, the the hardest part, obviously, is just stopping and recognizing that you need to make a change. And years before, well, not years before, but a year before, um, Samantha and I both felt like we really struggled with confidence. And so we talked a lot about this before I'd even become homeless. And I began to realize that my big struggle was having confidence in myself and it tied back into that abandonment. If I was confident, then I wouldn't feel like anyone would abandon me. And that's where this whole concept of, of flavors of confidence came from, which is the title of my book. Um, and it has the roots in Stoic philosophy. And Stoic philosophy, I think, is kind of trending upward at the moment. But at the time that we were talking about it a few years ago, it was kind of barely on the radar to anybody. But mm. I, it's talked about quite a bit uh, here recently. I see it more and more. And there's a, there's a lot of good things that, that are tied into that and in really looking at yourself. You know, read Marcus Aurelius's meditations a few times and you'll really take a deep dive into who you are as a person, right? And so I began doing that and realizing that I could, I could stand up. But after I found employment, after, you know, I, I, got, I was sober now and I, I went to work for Kubota Tractor and um, 
and I found myself working my way up from an entry level position very quickly being promoted uh, in rapid fire, which was which was really great. I mean, that's a, a very reinforcing point mm. in in your existence. Yeah. Like, OK, I'm sober and I'm I'm out here. I started a, as a as the lowest person in this company and I'm I'm risen five levels in two years. Obviously, I, something is going well, but I still didn't feel good. I didn't feel like I was going to be able to maintain it. Uh, the only thing that keeping me sober was telling myself, you can't drink. Well, that's not going to work long term. There's <laughs> something. I, I mean, it's just not. Eventually, you're yeah. going to break. And yeah. so that that's when it was uh, New Year's Eve on in 2016. Uh, going into 2017, I, I just I was sitting and uh, Samantha had given me this uh, self-portrait that she had called Flavors of Confidence two years before. And I was looking at it, and it's, a, it's comprised of tens of thousands of little dots. I mean, it, it's, and so that the whole structure of, the, when you stand back, it looks like a, a person, but when you get close, it looks like it's not even connected. It, it doesn't exist. And the whole point of that is that you can, piece together a person and make them look like a person, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're functioning underneath. And as I took that concept together, I was like, I'm going to create my own 10 step program. And so that's what I went off and did with his basis in, in stoicism. And I, as I, I, perfect, I perfected that and I would, uh, I would go to AA meetings and, and people were like, well, man, you're doing so well, what are you doing? It's like, well, I'm actually doing this. And then I started telling people about the flavors of confidence method and what I was doing. And then when I released my book uh, earlier this year and it got out, I began to realize that this was difficult for other people to understand. And so I boiled it into conceptually a method called the sober method, which stands for stoic, observe, behavior, execute, restore. And it works like the Deming cycle. I don't know. Are you familiar mm -hmm. with the Deming cycle? Uh, uh, the continuous improve. So the de the dem uh, Dr. Deming was uh, he worked in process improvement in um, uh, post World War II Japan, and he conceptualized that you could continuously improve something by constantly looking at it and referring back and coming back around again and again. And so this sober method works in the same way. So you reflect upon something, you make observations of yourself regarding this. Then you chart new behavior. You execute this behavior that you have have looked at that you want to change. And as you execute, you take measure on this and you actually say, oh, I'm doing well. This is going the way that I had planned. If it doesn't, you go back and you observe what's going on. You change it a little bit more. And then the restoration step is like, OK, I've pretty much perfected that. I, I'm going to like seek out some forgiveness for whatever this particular thing impacted. And then you return back and you, you do some more stoic deep dive. And so you're just like constantly working to improve yourself. And the uh. biggest thing, the biggest point that I make about the plan is that it doesn't require you to go abstinent right away because I fear that that is something that, that is very, very, very tough. It was tough for me. And if it was tough for me and I hear it a lot, people, you know, they, they really want to quit, but they can't. And the reason I couldn't is because I hadn't resolved that abandonment issue. So that happened because I took the deep dive into myself. And so the sober method allows people to take that deep dive, find these things that are ailing them. And as they do and they build their flavor of confidence, they don't need the substance anymore. And so they're, they find themselves sober rather than I'm going to quit today and be sober, which is a very difficult thing to do. Yeah. And did that work the same for the drugs? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, it, 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 what's quite interesting, I, I got a letter shortly after my book came out earlier this year from a reader in Germany to tell me that they had used my method to help them with their device addiction. And that just blew my mind to think that that could be done. But subsequent to that, I've really looked at it. And I mean, device addiction kind of falls along the same paths. A lot of people cannot put down their phones. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
So um, it, I think I think addiction of all types kind of follows that it's uh, it, you're nursing some challenge within you mm. that you are not confident enough to stand on your own about. And that's my belief. I really believe that the core challenge to addiction lies in confidence. And I, I've I've yet to see so far anyone I've worked with find that building their confidence didn't allow them to walk away from their addiction. Wow. That's so important. So where can people find the book? Yeah. So Silver Method is available anywhere books are, are sold. Um, and... Just, just search for Flavors of Confidence uh, there for both of the books, uh, but Sober Method. It's uh, available Amazon or I don't know, uh, any, whatever the major book retailer is in, in your neck of the woods, but I think Amazon's yeah. a, across the globe more yeah, or less. Yeah, I think Amazon's about the number one. <laughs> yep. <laughs> they've, now, they've slowly pushed themselves everywhere, so. Yeah. yeah. Now, is it available as an audible book? It is not yet. I just recorded the fifth chapter yesterday. I'm trying to get it out here within the by the end of this week. Uh, I, I oscillated back and forth on whether or not I should do the uh, recording or not, but I ended up deciding that I would. So this is my first foray into an audible book. So I'm kind of learning as I've, I've gone along, but uh, I think it'll be good. Brilliant, brilliant. So, where can people find you if they want to have a parlay? Find out a chat with oh, you. Absolutely. You can go to my website, MassimoRigatti.com, and I'm available on all uh, socials. If, if anybody wants to uh, find me, that's my handle on, on all social media as well. Uh, and I'd be more than more than happy to have discussion I, I talk with a lot of people who have read my book and it's always uh, nice to to hear from people and to to help people find their sobriety and be able to maintain it that's so important to me terrific well I smoke that has been fascinating really really interesting and to see to see where you come from and and, and where you got to and how you've ended up I think that's that's amazing that you've managed to turn everything around again. Thank you. You're most welcome. Wow, what a fascinating guest. Now, if you want to get a bit more on Massimo, you'll find all the details down in the description. So until the next one, TTFN, ta-ta for now.